Executive shuffling at Microsoft, Nest lets you share your home security footage, and Tim Stevens is here to talk about the fight for dashboard dominance. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 361 for Wednesday, June 17th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all of the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney. Joining me today is the nicest guy in tech, CNET's Tim Stevens. Later on, we'll discuss Android Auto and Apple's CarPlay. But first, some headlines. Big news out of Redmond today. The New York Times reports that four big Microsoft executives are out today, including Stephen Elop, the leader of Microsoft's device groups and a former chief executive at Nokia. The other three were Eric Rudder of the Server and Tools and Research Units, Mark Penn, Chief Insight Officer, and Kirill Tateranoff, leader of the Microsoft Business Solution Group. So, Tim, do you think any of these executive exits were a surprise? Uh, it's definitely interesting to see things uh, coming so soon, I guess, after the uh, Nokia acquisition. I mean, it has been a while now, but, uh, but ultimately, I would have thought they'd stay on a little bit longer to get um, Microsoft's devices division in line. But this definitely does point to, to Microsoft really not having much interest in continuing the Nokia line of hardware. Uh, which again draws the question of why the, the Nokia acquisition in the first place. We're losing a lot of uh, very talented people here uh, and ultimately a lot of the device division that resulted in some very nice devices from Nokia. So, um, you know, it does draw into question exactly what the, the goal is for Microsoft going forward for mobile devices in particular uh, and whether indeed they're going to make another smartphone down the road. That's a big question in my mind. So do you think that's why they, I mean, why, why do you think they bought Nokia? Any ideas? Uh, well, there's definitely a lot of expertise there and certainly a lot of other facilities that come along with Nokia. Nokia had made huge investments in, in developing uh, um, mobile testing labs and that kind of thing for their devices, which, which came along with it. Certainly a lot of experience when it comes to mobile software development as well. Uh, Nokia had a lot of great apps and things like that on their platforms that were exclusive uh, that uh, Microsoft can now include in Windows Phone and in Windows 10. Uh, but ultimately, you know, there's certainly some expertise there, but, um, you know, there was a lot of uh, a lot of conspiracy theories out there that uh, people believe that uh, Stephen Elop was put uh, in place at Nokia basically to drive the stock price down until uh, Microsoft could buy it. And then he would then ultimately come and take the throne at Microsoft. Uh, and that's obviously not proving to be the case. Uh, so now I'm wondering what uh, those conspiracy theorists will think uh, is Elon, Stephen Elop's next step. Yeah, interesting. So, I mean, do you think that this is just a reflection? This is also a reflection of just everything that Satya Nadella has been doing since he took the helm, um, and especially since you know, there's been so many changes since they announced Windows 10 in January. They sometimes seem to be like a completely different company. Is that in line with what happened today? Yeah, definitely huge shifts. And it seems like a huge focus on, on Windows 10. Uh, Terry Myerson, who they brought on board, has a lot of experience on the enterprise side of things and on the Windows side of things. Uh, ultimately, he's the one who more or less ended Windows Mobile back in the day and, and made a big push toward Windows Phone. Uh, so we're seeing a big push toward Windows 10 as being the core of the company. And I think that's that's definitely in line with the messaging that we've seen from Satya and ultimately their marketing as we've seen over the past few months too. Uh, so I think we'll see uh, a big push for sure on the Windows 10 side of things. And I'm curious to see what uh, Terry Myerson is up to. You know, that's kind of a hot seat that he's taken. Uh, Stephen Elop took over for uh, Julie Larson Green, who was uh, not in that seat for long either. Uh, but now Terry Myerson's taking over uh, the devices group and hopefully bringing everything together under the umbrella of Windows 10. I think that's the goal. Uh, and hopefully he's successful doing so. Yeah, I mean, the, the things that Terry Meyerson is in charge of, the hub, the Surface, the, I mean, the Surface hub, and the Surface, yeah, all the lens, everything. the Lumia, <laughs> the band, I mean, all, all the fancy yep. stuff. So, uh, yeah, I guess they trust him. Yeah, absolutely. That's a lot of very important uh, products for Microsoft, from gaming to home hardware and their new augmented reality push. Everything now is coming underneath uh, his his umbrella again, and, and again, all tied together by Windows 10 in theory. Uh, so we'll see, see how well that comes together. Yeah, I mean, it's been interesting. Did you get to take a look at the demo of HoloLens uh, that they did the other day, the Minecraft demo? 
Yeah, absolutely. It, it's it's kind of every kid's dream and uh, some grown up kids, including myself's dream as well. It looks like a lot of fun for sure. Uh, you know, still a lot of questions about the cost of the hardware and exactly how it works in real life. We've seen a lot of demos now. We haven't seen that many actual interactive demos where a, a lot of journalists have gotten a chance to really sit down and spend a lot of time with it, uh, especially in non-controlled environments. You know, these have all been demos at E3 or at Microsoft's developer conference. Uh, well, is it going to work that good in someone's living room? Uh, so a lot of questions about the, the technology, but Microsoft definitely showing that between this and the Oculus partnership, uh, they're in really good shape as the, the oncoming VR war comes uh, when it comes to home gaming and that kind of thing. And, and I'm pretty excited to see uh, what comes to that too. Yeah, I mean, and they still, for HoloLens, they still have that sort of vague time frame of in the win Windows 10 lifespan. Isn't that what they've said? Yeah, that's as much as I've seen, and they haven't really given us much of any indication when it comes to price either or availability. You know, when it was first announced, it seemed like this would be more of a research project, but now we're definitely seeing a lot more consumer applications for the thing. Uh, so it remains to be seen exactly what they want to do with this product. And, uh, and of course, that'll be a big deciding factor in when they decide how much they want to charge for it. Right. I mean, I, I've been thinking, I have 10-year-old twins, and I've been thinking, like, maybe they're aiming it when when my twins have disposable income. Like, that, that's conceivably <laughs> as far ahead. I mean, because that, that is who it is aimed at. And you said adult kids, but I think, you know, they really are just trying to, you know, get that generation of, I mean, every 10 year old plays Minecraft that I know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and many, many much older people as well play Minecraft. I mean, it's, it's the kind of thing that gets a lot of people excited, but ultimately it's the kind of thing that you have to figure is not going to be a cheap device. Uh, and, and you know, whether or not it's going to be ready in the next 12 months, 24 months, uh, that remains to be seen. Is it the kind of thing that you could reasonably expect a 12 year old to ask for Christmas and, and, and have their parent actually buy for them? I suppose it depends on the disposable income of their parent. Um, but yeah, this really does seem like more of a device for research and professionals that we've seen until this E3 demo. So I'm still curious to see exactly what they want to do with it. Um, but with the Oculus partnership that Marcus was working on as well, you know, that, that does give them uh, a, a presumably a lower cost, more consumer friendly alternative for the same kind of uh, same kind of interactivity. Right. So let's move on to another headline. Nest held a press conference in San Francisco today and they revealed a sort of new product and they updated <laughs> a few of their existing products. The, the new product is the Nest Cam, which is essentially a Dropcam Pro. And Dropcam is the Wi-Fi video streaming camera company that Nest acquired, I believe, after Nest was acquired by Google. Uh, I think I have that in the right order. Right. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think of the Nest Cam? Uh, ultimately, it looks like it'll have a little bit better picture quality. It's got some... Um, uh, infrared emitters for uh, low light video as well. But ultimately, you know, those were not complaints when it came to the Dropcam Pro. As you mentioned, you know, it was already a pretty high resolution camera and it already did pretty good when it came to low light video as well. Uh, so the new move here is really when it comes to the online availability of, of the video. Um, they're promising some smart, some kind of Google algorithms basically to make it better at figuring out what you want to look at and, and kind of triggering events based on, um, you know, if you see movement in your house, that kind of thing. Um, this isn't the first camera that we've seen with that kind of functionality. So I'm curious to see if this is you know, just kind of marketing speak, or if indeed there are some some really good smarts in this camera that will uh, make it smarter than your average IP camera, which which again has uh, this kind of functionality built in. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. It made me immediately think of the Google Photos app, which, you know, I have downloaded all my photos or uploaded all yeah. my photos. And it, it's always amazing mm -hmm. to me, everything that it knows, you know, all the facial recognition and it can, you know, capture the moments that I want to see. And then I think about how great it is. And then it starts to completely creep me out. That it knows <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And then the idea to have something like this in your home, watching you all the time and capturing those moments. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You could see that being a little bit disconcerting. But ultimately, it could be a good thing, too. I mean, if this were smart, enough to to really be able to tell the difference between my dog walking across the room and, and me walking across the room uh, and, and trigger emotion alert for one versus the other uh, that would be great um, but uh, you know that was one of the big pieces I think missing from from the the nest announcements today was any kind of notion of a, a security system based on all this you know they've got the the smoke alarm the uh, smart thermostat and now a camera too um, it wouldn't be that big of a step you think to go from there to, to something of a, a some sort of a home security system that can give you alarms or alerts if it's detecting motion uh, you know, maybe even have some kind of a monitoring system as well that can alert the the fire department or the police department if there are issues. You know, it seems like a, a, a natural small step from where they are now. And I was hoping to see something like that today. Uh, unfortunately, not the case. Yeah, it is interesting. They do seem to be aiming at people who are away from home. I don't I don't know. I'm I'm a working mom. So maybe this is just what I took from it. But, you know, mm -hmm. women who want to see what their family's doing, want to see what the babysitter's doing um, rather than, you know, keeping the bad guys out. I don't it does seem like that's that's the aim. Just checking to make sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think that's an easier uh, 
easier problem to tackle and ultimately one that prob probably comes with less liability as well. You know, if, if you're designed to protect the home and you don't alert somebody when a burglar walks through the living room, then that opens the door, I think, to more complaint than if, uh, you know, you, you don't trigger the babysitter walking across the living room, that kind of thing. So I can understand that. But ultimately, I think that's still a big need. And that's one of the big things that we see a lot of little companies trying to solve here and there with solutions that are good in some ways, but not great. Uh, it, it'd be really good to see someone like Google stepping into the home security market and, and doing something great there. Right. And then are they going to allow, it said that it would make it, your footage easy to share. I'm not exactly sure what they meant. Do they mean like posting your security cam footage on <laughs> Facebook? Presumably so, yeah. Or at least, you know, sending it to your friends. It, it's hard to imagine uh, what sort of footage you would want to share from the camera. I guess if your dog does something silly or if your child, you know, maybe the first steps of your child, you can see that kind of thing, I suppose. But, you know, more likely it'll be maybe something like uh, if you're playing a dancing game and someone does something silly and falls on their face, uh, that would be YouTube gold, perhaps. Right. Yeah. It's just part of us recording ourselves all the time and sharing it, I guess. Getting uh, closer. They also announced the new Nest, Nest Protect smoke detector. Uh, what makes this better than my current smoke detector? Uh, ultimately, it's got a little bit more smarts than your current smoke detector. Supposedly, it can detect the difference between types of fires and, and really tell you if something you know really serious is happening versus more of a slow-burning fire. I'm not sure the value of something like that. Ultimately, if there's a fire, you probably want to know about it either way. Uh, but they said they can do that. Uh, you can also turn it off from your smartphone, uh, which is, again, something of somewhat dubious value, in my opinion. I don't know if I want to be trying to find my phone as the alarm is blurring to, to shut it off. Uh, but ultimately, you know, it does have a carbon monoxide detector built in as well, which is nice. You only have one device to worry about instead of two. Uh, and because of that, it can also turn off your your home um, heating system. So if a fire or carbon monoxide alarm goes off, it can turn off the furnace. And ultimately, furnaces are a pretty big cause of carbon monoxide in homes when it, we have issues uh, and people die from that sort of thing. It's often because of a leaky exhaust or something like that on the furnace. So ultimately, just shutting that off is a pretty good feature to have. And, and indeed, probably one of the biggest features of this uh, smoke detector is that uh, they're promising discounts through some insurance providers. Right now, it's a very limited selection. Uh, but if they can expand that and get you 5% off of your homeowner's insurance, uh, that thing may actually pay for itself in pretty short order. That makes sense. I'm guessing that you've never had a faulty um, smoke detector that went off every time you made toast. Uh, no, I've not actually had, well, I, you know, I certainly have been experienced burnt toast in the office and that kind of thing, but uh, but thankfully, no, I've not had that issue myself. Right, because I can see how I, I, I would like to uh, turn it off with my smartphone as opposed to what I now do, which is open all the windows, wave things in front of, you know, and then the dog goes crazy and, you know, it's, uh, I, I would appreciate that. But apparently they're also that. supposed to, it was supposed to have gesture control, like you could just wave your hand in the air and make it stop or something. Minority yeah, that was one style. of the big... That was one of the big issues with the original, actually, was that, it, you know, if there's a fire, pretty good chance someone's going to be running around the house. Uh, and, and so it would it was actually detecting that as if someone trying to turn off the, the alarm. And that was one of the big issues why the first one was recalled. Uh, they didn't make any mention of whether or not gesture control will return in this version. I wouldn't be surprised, given all the issues ahead with the first one, if they decide that that's perhaps not the best feature to, to include. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in other news, the California Labor Commission said today that Uber drivers are employees, not contractors. This is good news for employees as far as benefits are concerned. But is it good news for Uber? Definitely not good news for Uber, no. Uh, this means that ultimately they have a lot more responsibilities to worry about uh, when it comes to uh, you know human resources alone. That's a big part of managing a big company, and suddenly Uber has hundreds of thousands of employees that they need to worry about, uh, in theory anyway. you know This is still early days, and there'll be appeals and lots of things like that. But ultimately, this means they now need to worry about uh, vacation time, health benefits, um, you know any sort of workers' compensation claims, and of course, expenses as well for the, all these vehicles. Um, that's a huge increase in their cost, uh, and it's definitely something that's, that's that could cause Uber real pain, possibly you know to the point of uh, ending the company or making it not uh, financially feasible given its current pricing, that sort of thing. So it's definitely a big issue for Uber and something that uh, they're going to be fighting tooth and nail. Uh, we'll see exactly how this works out. But right now, yeah, it's a very bad side for Uber. Right. I mean, they keep saying that they're just like at the platform. They're just the technology platform. They're not the employer. I mean, does anyone really believe that? You know, for them to be a technology platform, there has to be other uh, other systems or other services built on top of that platform. And right now, it's it's just Uber. Uh, so, no, it's hard to see them as anything other than a business. Uh, you, you know, I think they do have a reasonable claim that these people are independent contractors that are working for a fee-based sort of employment. Um, but ultimately, you know, if, if you are working with people who are working on a full-time basis for you, uh, at that point, in, in a lot of areas, that, that means that ultimately these people are considered to be full-time employees, even if they are on a contract basis or in a part-time 
full-time basis. Uh, and so therefore they are eligible for the sorts of benefits that you would expect from a full-time employee. So I think this is uh, something that Uber needs to be worried about. Um, and, and I don't think that they have, uh, you know, I, I think they should be worried anyway. I'll leave it at that. Well, I mean, do you think other startups should also be worried? I mean, there's all this, you know, in you know Silicon Valley, it's the Uber for X, you know, the Uber for everything. <laughs> and I mean, even right. yesterday, we heard rumors that Amazon was thinking of replacing UPS delivery people with anyone who wanted to deliver packages. And that was just a rumor. But I mean, mm -hmm. it, it makes sense that, I mean, we part of what we pay for UPS is workers' benefits. Uh, so I, I wonder if other startups are scared by this news. Yeah, they definitely should be. There are certainly quite a few other startups that uh, everything from valeting your car. And then there are other package delivery services out there too. But I think a lot of it comes down to whether people are reasonably making a living out of this as, as full timers. You know, if it's the kind of thing where someone's doing it for an hour here and there, uh, ultimately at that point, they probably have a harder claim uh, as trying to be considered a full time employee versus someone like a, an Uber driver who is working eight or 10 or even more hours per day and ultimately making enough money to work full time. Uh, you know, it's a fine line uh, trying to decide one way or the other. But ultimately, you know, I think Uber has a real uh, hard time ahead of it because they have so many people who are working full time for Uber versus a lot of these other startups, which are just people doing a couple hours here or there. Right. Now, have you heard anything about um, Uber's? I know I've heard sort of vague rumors about their connection to self-driving car technology. Do you think that's the end game for them? They're just waiting to have no employees at all to have to worry about benefits? Yeah, that's that's definitely the end game for Uber. Uber, they want to be providing a service, you know, ultimately they want to get people from A to B and charge them for that service. And, you know, ultimately people are kind of a liability for them. And as we've seen a very expensive liability, whether it be these uh, issues of people's safety that we've seen in the past, which are very troubling. And now, of course, these issues with uh, human resources and those sorts of things that they're going to have to worry about going forward. Um, you know, humans are very expensive people, but ultimately humans are very important uh, to the, the sorts of services that, that they're providing. Uh, Self-driving cars are coming, but they're not going to be ready uh, for Uber to, uh, you know, just fire all their drivers tomorrow, unfortunately. So Uber's got to figure this out. And that is the way that Uber wants to go. But uh, they still got a couple of years ahead of them of research, at least. All right. Well, speaking of robots taking our jobs, let's move on to drone news. Reuters reports that the FAA expects to clear U.S. commercial drones drones within a year. Uh, now, is this ahead of schedule as far as we know? Yeah, that's definitely moving things up. Uh, I think they're getting a lot of pressure internally and from businesses as well that, that ultimately, you know, the drone industry is huge and it's only going to continue to get more big. Uh, and there's a lot of concern that perhaps the U.S. government being slow to come up with a nationwide legislation on this issue could really hampen U.S. companies' ability to compete in this market. Uh, so ultimately, they are pushing things up. You know, we had expected regulation sometime by the end of next year, maybe the early 2017. Now they're saying that it'll be ultimately one year from today at the latest and possibly even earlier from that, that we'll see some sort of guidelines in place for nationwide drone usage, which is great. Uh, there was a lot of debate even whether or not this should be a federal issue or whether it should be a state issue. Uh, this definitely seems like the FAA is going to try to make it a federal issue, something that will apply nationwide, which is great. Uh, but there's still a, a lot of questions about whether or not uh, the, you know, the dream of Amazon delivering packages by drones across New York City or San Francisco or anywhere else uh, will, will be a reality. Um, but that's certainly uh, what uh, what Amazon's hoping for, and uh, I think a lot of consumers are hoping for too. So this will be in big cities to start. You're probably not going to get your packages to your undisclosed dis location in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> probably not going to have to worry about drones coming to me here in the woods, if only because it would be pretty difficult to get through the trees to my house. Uh, but yeah, ultimately, I think this is the kind of thing where population density is going to be a pretty important thing when it comes to cost. And also because the range of these drones is probably not going to be that great. Uh, so you, you'd expect to see a drone maybe flying for a mile at the most, coming back and recharging, picking up another package and going out, at least in the early days. Um, but, uh, you know, there's still a lot of questions about where do these drones land? Uh, a lot of people don't have access to the roofs of their buildings in the cities, that sort of thing. Uh, it's a pretty complicated issue. Amazon's excited to figure it out, but they ultimately need this framework to be put in place and then build upon uh, any kind of a business plan. So they can't really make too many steps forward in terms of implementing this kind of thing until the government decides exactly what they're going to let them do. Okay. Well, we have some more stories that I want to cover. Are you, you still okay to stick around? I'm happy to st stick around. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So coming up, <laughs> we will talk about how how Android Auto stands up to Apple's CarPlay and whether you need either of them at all. But first, this show is brought to you by our sponsors. If you want to support the show, we don't ask for money, but we do ask that you consider trying the products that our sponsors have to offer. I get it. Not all of them will offer service that you want right now, but we all do need to eat. 
So Blue Apron is an easy one to try and see if you like them. Blue Apron delivers ready-to-cook meals right to your door. For less than $10 per meal, Blue Apron sends you fresh ingredients, perfectly proportioned with step-by-step instructions. Now, I do not like using my iPad or my iPhone to display recipes. When I'm cooking, I end up getting greasy fingerprints and flour and all kinds of stuff all over them. So Blue Apron is nice because they will send you printed pictures on hard cardstock so you can spill stuff all over them. It won't matter. You can still see the recipe. And no trips to the grocery store, no waste from unused ingredients. A few week, nights ago, I came home to a delicious, healthy meal of salmon cooked by my husband from our Blue Apron box. The husband did not come included in the box. That's a different kind of company. However, each Blue Apron meal is 500 to 700 calories per serving. Cooking takes half an hour. Shipping is free. And the menus are always new. They won't send the same meal twice. They work around your schedule and dietary preferences. And Blue Apron's experts source only the best seasonal ingredients for incredible meals like seared cod, with spring vegetables and lemon mustard vinaigrette and huevos rancheros with salsa verde, radishes, and avocado. If you care about providing healthy meals for you and your family, try Blue Apron. It is the better way to cook. If you want to support this show, you can, and you can get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's right, two free meals just for going to blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Tonight. So your colleague Tim did some field testing to compare Android's Auto, Android Auto, to Google, to Apple's CarPlay to see how they stack up. He's been using these two systems side by side in a test car for eight months. Uh, what was his take on these products? Right, we've got Antoine Goodwin on our team, who's an expert when it comes to head units and aftermarket equipment and cars and that kind of thing. And and um, he spent a lot of time with both of these systems, and both of them have kind of come to the consumer market within a few months of each other, which makes it um, makes it nice and easy to test the two. And Pioneer has uh, been kind enough to implement uh, compatibility with both systems in their head units, which, again, makes it pretty easy to go from one to the other. Uh, so, yeah, Antoine spent some time with both. And it's interesting how similar the two systems are actually to use. Uh, you know, the basic idea is to give you the power of your smartphone without all the distracting uh, nature of a smartphone operating system, either iOS or Android. Uh, and ultimately, they're both pretty good when it comes to that, both when it comes to voice recognition for, saying, a destination for that kind of thing. And also when it comes to being predictive when it comes to uh, knowing, for example, that you got an email from someone with flight information uh, and knowing that you might want to drive to the airport to pick them up at that time. So, for example, when you plug your Android phone in, it'll give you the interface of Google Now effectively with all the cards that you would expect. You can tap on a card to get uh, directions somewhere, or you can speak to uh, the phone and get directions that way as well. Same thing for iOS with uh, with CarPlay. Same basic functionality, look in your calendar, give you directions, and uh, you can get your music uh, playback. And it's pretty interesting, again, how close the two systems are. The big difference between the two really when it is when it comes down to uh, developer support. Uh, if you want to get your app running in Apple CarPlay, you really need to go through Apple, and they need to more or less approve your app before it'll show up. On the Google side of things, they've more or less approved a set of templates. Uh, and if you can get your application to fit within those templates, then you're pretty much good to go. You don't need to really worry about uh, going uh, through the Google route. Uh, you can just release a new version of your app, and it'll be good to go in Android Auto. Uh, so a bit more of a developer-friendly way, but ultimately it is a little bit more restricting because if your app doesn't fit within those templates, uh, you uh, you got to wait until Google releases some more templates, I guess. So good from the developers, Android Auto is better from the developer's perspective. And I guess if, you know, if you're the type of person that doesn't want to use, you know, the built-in chat in iOS and you, you like to use WhatsApp or another chat, like you're not going to be able to do that in uh, Apple's CarPlay, right? Whereas you could in Android Auto. Right. So for example, if you have a chat system or some sort of a media playback service, let's say a podcast app, that kind of thing, there's basically a media template that you can write your app to fit within. So there's a play button, a skip button, and that kind of thing. And you can redefine what those buttons do, but the placement of those buttons is fixed. Uh, so that way you don't have to worry about whether your app is compatible with all the international legislation when it comes to distracted driving and all that stuff. Google's pretty much taking care of that for you. Uh, all, all you need to do is make sure that your app fits within that template. So from a developer standpoint, it is easier and, and quicker to get your app on Android Auto. Uh, but again, you can come up with a custom app that does exactly what you want it to do on the CarPlay side of things. You just have to go and work with Apple before you can get it released. Right. So, and so some of the major things we like to do on our car, listen to music. I mean, that's the easiest thing to do without being distracted. Uh, right, right now, it looks like both of them will have the basic, you know, I think uh, Spotify, you can listen to both. And, you know, obviously you can listen to iTunes radio uh, in Apple's CarPlay. But I'm mm -hmm. curious about what will happen when Apple Music comes out at the end of the month, uh, if they'll still feature Spotify and things like that in, in the app, in the dashboard app. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's a good question. Hopefully we don't see this sort of turning into an internally competitive landscape where they're disabling uh, competitive apps. Uh, you know, I think that Apple, I think Apple's probably smart enough to know that they shouldn't kill Spotify uh, in their service. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll certainly find out soon enough, but I'm, I'm sure they'll release an update to iOS that will enable Apple Music and, and everything else to work with the new services. Um, whether or not they release an Android Auto version of that, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I guess we'll wait and see. Um, but certainly, again, that's something you don't have to worry about on the Android side of things, again, because developers control what shows up. Um, you know, Spotify is out there. Uh, Beyond Pod, which is one of my favorite apps for podcasting, they have a beta version that works in Android Auto too. Um, so there's, there's a lot of uh, things coming on the Android side of things, and hopefully Apple will not be restricted when it comes to competitive uh, challenges, uh, just when it comes to the technology in the, the safety aspect. Right, because I know there's issues with Pandora on both. For some reason, you can't, I think you can't listen to Pandora on both and that may be because they have a deal with some other onboard systems, I think. Yeah, Pandora's definitely gone out and worked with a lot of the automakers to make sure that their app is kind of built into the head units of a lot of these systems. I think ultimately they probably signed some contracts or have some sort of an exclusivity agreement that prevents them from working in other ways. So I think that's probably the reason and ultimately I'm sure we'll see that go away at some point. Uh, but we are see seeing more and more Auto manufacturers actually writing custom apps that will extend into Android Auto and into CarPlay, uh, Cadillac and GM and that kind of thing. Uh, so ultimately, that shows that the auto manufacturers themselves are getting a little bit less um, reluctant to support this uh, technology. And so that should help uh, the companies like Pandora kind of break out of those agreements, I hope. Right. So with people that don't have, they have older cars like myself, um, <laughs> is it, does it, does it make sense to upgrade to a, a newer car just for these features? Or am I getting essentially the same thing if I just get a car mount and put my phone on the dashboard? You'll be getting most of the same thing if you do upgrade. Uh, well, if you just put your car on the dashboard, then ultimately you won't be, or put your phone on the dashboard, I should say, uh, you won't be able to get access to Android Auto or to Apple CarPlay. You have to have a, a compatible head unit that will support this sort of thing. And basically, once you plug your phone into that head unit, it more or less disables the phone itself and forces you to interact with your phone through the head unit, mostly using voice. Uh, so it's a much safer way to interact with your phone. It does take away a lot of the power of your phone. You know, you can't uh, reach down and, and type in an, an address or uh, type in a response to a text message, but ultimately you probably shouldn't be doing those things while you're driving anyway, uh, so that's okay. Um, but you can, if you have an older car uh, like you do or like I do as well, uh, go out and get an aftermarket head unit. Uh, we're big fans of the Pioneer 4100 NEX and the 8100 NEX. Uh, the 4100 you can find online for under $600, still a fair bit of money, um, but, um, but ultimately that will give you all the power of Android Auto or CarPlay uh, in a safe way, and, uh, and ultimately it'll make your older car feel like a new one. Uh, but if you are looking to get a new car, definitely ask and make sure that it has CarPlay and Android Auto built in. Uh, more and more manufacturers are supporting it. And probably by, you know, this time next year, just about every new car should have both systems, which is great. All right. So they're not, you're not going to have to decide between a model of car and, you know, a, a type of, you, know, go, but you won't have to decide between Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Anything short of Ferrari, pretty much you've got to support for both. Ferrari has got uh, ties with EDQ, so there's only CarPlay there. But yeah, just about everybody else, which is really encouraging. We've seen GM and Ford and everybody else pledge support for both systems, uh, which is really encouraging. You know, there was a lot of concern uh, this time last year that uh, auto manufacturers would pick their favorites. And so you had to pick which car you want based on which phone was in your pocket. Uh, but ultimately, from a developer standpoint, implementing one is pretty much the same as implementing the other. So it's pretty easy for them to include both. And so do either of the features have anything that's such like the killer app that would actually make someone switch from an Android phone to an iPhone or the other way around just because they liked the dashboard system better? No, I don't think so. Functionally, again, they're very, very similar. Uh, you know, if you're already using Android and you're already into Google now and it's already figured out your life and your calendar and it's already watching everything that you do and so it's already predicting everywhere you want to go, uh, then that's a pretty strong incentive to go with something that has Android Auto built in. Um, but ultimately, you know, when it comes to mapping functionality, pretty similar there. We haven't seen Waze come to Android Auto yet, uh, and I hope that Google does bring Waze over because, of course, it's a very popular app. Um, but, but ultimately, that's not there on either platform, and, uh, and ultimately, the offerings are quite similar. And neither platform is going to let me watch True Detective on HBO Go, probably. That is correct. Okay. I'm sorry to say. Yep. Okay. You can listen to your podcast, but, uh, but no video. That would be illegal. Okay. <laughs> so is, in terms of distracted driving, do you think personally think this is hurting or helping? Uh, it's definitely it's helping quite a bit uh, because... 
phones are very distracting devices. You know, if even if you're only looking at navigation, you'll still get a notification pops up that says something about a text message, but you only see a bit of the text message. So it's tempting to reach down and touch it and open the text message. And of course, if it's important, it's, re it's very tempting to reply. Uh, with these systems, you know, you can see the text message. It will be read to you. You can then speak a response if you want to, uh, all without taking your eyes off the road. Uh, and ultimately, those notifications that are very distracting on operating systems, you know, uh, version updates or tweet replies or that sort of thing, those are hidden from your view as well. Uh, and ultimately, the whole idea is to make it very simple and easy to use, mostly by your voice or by steering wheel controls. Uh, and so these systems definitely make it safer to drive and they disable your phone. So if once you plug in to Android Auto or CarPlay, the display is powered off effectively. There's no point in picking up your phone anymore. There's no point in looking down or trying to type on a tiny little keyboard. Uh, so yeah, yeah, there is some distraction for sure, but it's much, much better than trying to use your phone. Yeah, I like the idea that it turns off your phone because sometimes it's, the computers do know better than us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And once you look down, you know, it's pretty easy to lose track of time and the difference between looking down for a second and five seconds, that can make a big difference. Right. So sometimes the computers do not know as much as we do. And earlier this morning, you <laughs> tweeted a link to one of your favorite robots subreddits. Unfortunately, we like to keep it family friendly here, so we can't say exactly the name, but uh, we'll put that link in our show notes. Suffice it to say, it's a subreddit devoted to robots that are not very good at their jobs. Uh, there was, you tweeted this excellent, uh, that there's the subreddit right now. There was something that you tweeted that I just, I spent, I mean, maybe 30 minutes <laughs> watching it over and over again. That's an exaggeration, but I laughed a lot and I cried. Uh, it's yeah, a video, it's a video um, about a dog trying to give a robot trying to give a dog a treat um, and I think maybe we can show it uh, if we have it and my big question is why do we need robots that to give dogs treats I mean here it is <laughs> 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 the same reason that we need dogs because they make us laugh uh, and right. you know this is uh, you know I'm sure that dog has done some funny things uh, but ultimately that that robot was doing you know trying to feed the dog a pop tart and then walking on the pop tart and smearing the pop tart all over the floor and then just falling on his face at the end yeah it's um it's one of my favorite uh, gifs I've seen in a very long time <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, I think that's exactly why we need robots to entertain us, uh, at least until they get knives and guns and then it's all over. But uh, until then, we can laugh at them and, and enjoy right. our, our I privilege think, steps. Yeah, that's one of the robots. They are entertaining us and we're not paying attention. <laughs> They're all taking our jobs. They're going to uh -huh. you know, be all weaponized and yeah, delivering our packages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there was also on that subreddit an excellent video of uh, the DARPA robot challenge of just all of the robots falling down. So I highly recommend. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Yeah, there's up. a lot of fear that these DARPA bots are doing, uh, doing uh, uh, you know, are going to be ultimately fighting our wars from us. Uh, these sorts of things that show that we have uh, we have some time. Yes, they do show us. And also, it's just like it, it shows that <laughs> they're more human because we're laughing at them. You know, I do, I do think that it, it tells us something that we think this is so hilarious when they're falling down. I mean, really. You know. So hopefully they can laugh at each other, too. Yeah. Right. Then they'll really win once they can laugh at each other. <laughs> Tim Stevens, thank you so much for joining us. Tim is the editor at large at CNET. Where is the best place for people to follow what you're doing? Uh, definitely CNET.com, of course. And if you want to catch me on Twitter, it's Tim underscore Stevens. And I uh, look for a review in the near future of the 2016 Nissan GTR, which is a very fun car. And I can't wait to drive it. Well, thank you so much, Tim. My pleasure. Take care. You too. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. You can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. Even if you've already subscribed, I highly recommend checking out our new website, twit.tv. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.